Awesome. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you. Uh, today, we are so, so, uh, I'm just so excited to welcome Eduarda, who is a PhD student in neuroscience to come talk about Jupyter Notebooks. She has used them for her research and also at her, um, her work. And she, oh, and, um, and we are hosting this uh, with Dr. York, who is um, very graciously put it at the same time as the data science group, so that we could have a lot of our, our coders here. And I'm just so excited to hear uh, Eduardo's talk and our discussion. Oh, thanks again for the, the invitation. It's pretty nice. And I really like the idea of this exchange between reproducibilities. So as Dan already mentioned, I do my PhD in neuroscience in Bordeaux. I also work for Amsterdam, for a lab in Amsterdam, and I co-host the reproduci reproducibility in Bordeaux and in Amsterdam. <clears throat> Just to explain, I did my master's and each year was in each university. So that's why the link. And uh, so today I'll be talking about Jupyter Notebooks and because I don't think it's possible to teach Jupyter Notebooks very just a short time, I will more like go through some interesting tools that I think people should know of, and then show an example of a notebook that I worked on for the past year and we recently published. So, so what are Jupyter Notebooks? So they are open source web application that <clears throat> Sorry, allowed you to create and share computational documents that contain so rich text, a live code, equations, visualizations, um, audio, images. So it's, it's really, um, we can have very different things, not only code blocks, and that facilitates to, the, to create tutorials and explain things to, to people. So it supports over 40 programming languages. Uh, like I said, text, figures, videos, audio. It has interactive output, so you can uh, people can run your code again, your code box again, and see the outputs, the plots. Uh, it can have some big data integration. There are several extensions or add-ons, which I will be covering some of them uh, here. It can be easy to share with others, so there are tools that are specific to, to that. And there's a growing use in the of Jupyter notebooks in several platforms like Coursera and scientific workshops. So it's really becoming wide. What do you know? So today I will just mention uh, some add-ons that I think are cool. So for example, I will talk about JupyterLab, JupyterHub, uh, Hub, Voila, DataLore, Binder, and, and GitHub. And given a um, special focus on Binder and GitHub, because that's what I use for my work. So just to show you a Jupyter Notebook. So basically it's a, a computational document that you, will, uh, you can get it through Anaconda. Um, and it will open in your browser, uh, this, uh, something like this. And basically you can fill it with text and code box and build your tutorial. This is a nice start, it's, it's pretty good, but sometimes you want to have more than one Jupyter uh, notebook open. So you can also use different languages. So there's what we call Jupyter Lab. So basically it's this environment that you can have different tabs and you can have different notebooks at the same time. So for example, in our case, we did two notebooks for our analysis, and then it was nice to have both at the same time that we could just switch tabs and, and play with them. And JupyterLab is very good for, for that. And it's also available in Anaconda. Um, and then there's JupyterHub. So JupyterHub is more when you want to, for example, if you want to teach a course and you want people to use Jupyter notebooks and you don't want them to go through the installing process, you can have a centralized server which will uh, offer the opportunity that people can open the Jupyters in their own computers. So you basically control all the installation process by providing them the Jupyter notebooks directly. And this can be useful also in companies and, and things like that. Um, I might use it in the next summer, so, so let's see. I'm curious to see how it goes. Uh, so we can avoid the installation issues that can really be an issue when you're teaching the course. And the next two that I wanted to mention is, is Voila. So this is more when your audience is not really pro like programmers or something like that. So people that you want to hide the code behind this. So from this animation, you're gonna see 
that they will show basically a Jupyter notebook and then they use this tool called Voila and it will hide the code blocks. So it's simpler and clearer for people that don't really get programming to just see the outputs and play with it. And they use this thing called Jupyter widgets. So that allows you to scroll to parameters and change the outputs based on these parameters. So for example, if you're working in something that it depends on a density filtration or something like that, I don't know, you can just scroll around and then you change the output without really having to show the code to anyone. So for some audience, audience can be important. Just let the video finish for a second look. So as you see, um, you end up with no code blocks, just the output. I think it's quite cool. Then uh, I wanted to talk about data lore. So it's a cloud-based way of running your Jupyter notebooks. It's like a website that you can create your Jupyter notebooks and you don't have to install anything in your computer. So it can also, it's easily to share, it's easy to share with others and collaborate on, on notebooks this way. The main limitation is that it's, it's, it becomes paid. So you have some computational limit and for bigger projects, you might have to pay and it's a bit, well, can be a, a drawback, right? So what we did in our uh, lab, because we didn't want to, to pay, we used this tool called Binder. So Binder is like a Docker system that you can create a Jupyter notebook, host it on GitHub. And from what Dana told me, you are familiar with GitHub. So I, I won't go into a lot of detail what it is version control in, Git, in GitHub. But if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask. But basically you put your notebooks on, on GitHub, you use the link on GitHub on the Binder website and it will generate this link that can run in the Docker and then they will create this image and run the notebook in a Docker system without having to install on your own computer. So if people are trying to just have a look on your work and try it out without cloning anything, it's a nice way of doing it. Uh, so yeah, so this is all, of course, GitHub. It's a good thing that to, to know about when using Jupyter Notebooks and if you want to share it with the world, because it's a nice way of version controlling your, your notebooks and whatever you're doing and also having this community of programmers and people that could be interested in your work. So just to give you some uh, background. So last year I was doing my master thesis in Amsterdam in a lab that works with brain imaging data. And we wanted to create a notebook, a computational notebook for a specific type of analysis on this data in neuroscience and to also provide some different visualizations. So 3D visualizations of brain data like here we have in the image. So we created this notebook that is now on GitHub, is available. And we based our readme on um, the paper that I sent today, the 10 rules that we have an idea of how to make it more reproducible. So now I will switch to the, my GitHub page, just one second. Okay. Just this. Let's see if it's gonna be, okay. So basically this is a uh, GitHub, as some might know, GitHub page, this is our repository. And we put here uh, all our project, the whole project, and we created this readme really based on the 10 rules paper. So we have the status of the repository, Python version, the DOI. So we hosted our work on Zenodo to have a DOI. Uh, of course, we explain the general information about this Jupyter notebook, how to install, et cetera. The requirements, more or less what it should supposed to do. And also we, Publish it on a preprint so people can also find the background theoretical information of this work. So it's, it's on preprint. And then, like in this, um, we have this web based options for people that don't want to install our notebooks straight away. So we have the HTML pages. So basically, you can see the notebooks uh, in the outputs, the expected outputs from whatever we are computing. So here just information about the packages in the computer. And then all, every cell will show its, its um, outputs. So people can have an, a quick idea of how it goes. <clears throat> and then you, of course you have Binder, which allows you to play with the notebook uh, in a cloud-based system, in a Docker system. 
So here, I hope the kernel is working. Kernel, are you alive? Let me see. Uh, kernel, yeah, that is good. So basically, you open Binder. It will go through this process of mounting the image and, and running the and opening the Jupyter notebook. Um, you can have use either notebook or the Jupyter lab in Binder. So there are two options. And here, in this case, I'm just going to show you a bit. So here, for example, you see that I put some text, explain a bit what this is about. Then we have some sort of links to specific parts. So for example, if I click here, it goes straight to this part. Uh, this summary of our notebook. And then you can start, for example, you run the cell, you import your packages, you stop with the warnings, and then I can run this. And then we'll give the output that should match with the HTML. Um, and then, yeah, we can play, just import the matrix. So it's a brain connectivity matrix. <clears throat> Um, from fMRI data, functional MRI. Um, yeah, so some information that are important for some naming of the areas. I'm just going to go up to the connectivity matrix. Uh, okay. And then we should get, uh, yeah, so basically you can see that things pop up. <laughs> And you can see the outputs and run it yourself. And if you want to play with it, change line, code lines, it's, you, you can do it, right? So it's, it's if you want to put, I don't know, something like false here, it's possible. You, you can play around with it and test it yourself. It's not static, let's say, like the HTML. And then, like I said, you can have some images to uh, explain a bit more, like in a paper, like you do. And basically, goes like this all the way and some references and acknowledging this. So I just want to show you also our 3D visualizations. So that's one of the coolest part of this work. So the part two is dedicated to data visualization and the 3D visualization. So we basically start by importing the matrix and then we should have, where is the frame? I don't know if it's not rendering properly. Maybe sometimes this render uh, that page the most they get stuck. Yeah, so here. Oh, nice. Yeah. Hello. Let's go to the here. So you have this brain, you can play with it, but yeah, you can turn it around. You can see which nodes there are. You can zoom in, zoom out. It's a bit slow now, but uh, the idea is that you can really see the brain data and play with it and see which nodes you are working with. And this should be fairly easy to go here. Yeah. And you can zoom in, zoom out, and things like that. So that's our work, and everything was done to, to Jupyter Notebook, really aiming to improve things in the field and also facilitate whoever wants to start working with this sort of analysis in a very open science driven way. So now let me just go back to my presentation. So on the side of the, the paper that I chose, uh, of course, it's not just that you have a tool, it will make everything perfect. So the second paper that I sent it really shows that if you don't use these tools properly, you won't have a good reproducibility rate and you, people won't be able to reproduce your work. So there are some 10 rules, right? So you have to tell a story, you have to really go step by step and try to imagine how, if someone is totally new to this, how can I best explain this? And you have to, it's, it's good to organize in the way that it's modular, you have divisions, you have cell by cell, you have text explaining your steps. Uh, you, of course, document the process. Of course, you use your dependencies because in Python, I don't know how it's in R, but in Python, it can be a pain that packages change their versions and then everything stops working. So it's very important to use, for example, pip freeze and have these requirements.txt. Also, binder will ask for it to be able to mount the image. Version control and GitHub, like you said, uh, build a pipeline and 
have some data so that people can ask whatever you're doing. And of course, advocate for open science. So that's what we are doing here. And these are really important rules. And I guess in the paper, there's a lot of hints and other like more specific websites that you can go to and have a look. But if you're working with filter notebooks, it's, it's really good to follow this workflow. So. so here I just want to provide you with a cool gallery of interesting Jupyter notebooks. So this link will be in my slides. I will send it to, to Dana. And also there's an easy to follow tutorial on the data web webpage. So thank you very much for your attention and yeah.